We're gonna take a look at the Land Rover Discovery 2. We're gonna do a kind of a buyer's guide and also common maintenance issues that arise if you're a new owner. Now, for a vehicle of this age, the first one started in, in 1999 and they completed in 2004. A lot of the issues that are gonna happen are gonna be determined by the previous owners. And what I'm going to focus on today are common issues with the platform that the Land Rover community has resolved. And if you follow these steps, you'll be able to identify issues that you'll need to correct. But also if you're a new owner, you'll be able to know what you need to do as soon as possible before focusing on lift and tires. You should focus on these things if you want your Land Rover Discovery 2 to last 200,000 miles and beyond. And let's get started. The front drive shaft of the Land Rover Discovery 2 is a um, double cardon shaft, which is really nice as far as alignment with various lift sizes because you have two U-joints and a ball joint in the center, and then you have the U-joint in the back with the, with the slip yoke. Now, the problem is they used high quality sealed U-joints, which I like. Now, why is that a problem? Well, the problem is, is the location of that front shaft is right next to the two catalytic converters. Now, you'll see a theme with the Discovery 2, and that is temperature kills. Now, what happens is eventually over time, the heat from the catalytic converters dries out that grease and it seizes. And to a lot of owners, this seizing happens suddenly, catastrophically, on the freeway. If you're lucky, it might start loosening a cap like a normal U-joint failure, or you'll start hearing the clicking as you drive. But as I've researched the forums, that's actually rare. The common mode of failure is this drive shaft will seize at highway speed, the U-joint will shear, and that will become a medieval weapon flailing around, and typically it rips out the front transmission with it and the owner is left towing the vehicle they sell it in a rage for parts or if they want to fix it they're fixing a drive shaft and they're replacing a transmission which is really quite expensive transmission is a zf five speed unit on this it's proven high reliable you rarely have issues with the transmissions on these vehicles it's this drive shaft fails and swings it out and then you have a huge massive repair so what do you do well the community has come up with a fix, and there are many vendors, Tom Woods, um, GBR, I use GBR Utah. They um, have rebuilt serviceable drive shafts. Now these have Zerk fittings for the U-joints, and there is a ball joint fitting that you'll take a needle adapter and stick it in that ball joint and grease that ball joint too, because there have been people who have bought serviceable shafts, they kept up on the U-joint greasing, forget the ball joint, the ball joint seizes, and it does the same mode of failure. So you gotta make sure you grease everything. The high quality rebuilt shafts, or the high quality um, shafts from Tom Woods, GBR, the, the Zerks will be all lined up. So it's really easy, especially if you have a lift kit. You just look underneath, pull the vehicle until all the Zerks are lined up, go underneath, grease it, do it every five to 7,000 miles with high temp. I use the, the red high temp um, lithium grease, and I, I haven't had a problem, or, you can rebuild it with sealed units. Now the sealed units are excellent. They last about 100 to 150,000 miles. So if you're gonna use the sealed units, you don't wanna deal with greasing, just pull it out, take it to a driveline shop, do it yourself, rebuild the thing with high quality sealed joints, including that center ball joint. Make sure it is a sealed one too, and not a greasable one. I've seen people, or I've seen photos of people who actually put sealed U-joints, kept that ball is a serviceable, they forget to service it, same failure. Make sure everything is sealed or serviced just to keep it consistent. And then you put that in there, you don't have to worry about it for 100,000 miles. And then you should start thinking about replacing this so you don't have that failure again. I'm, I'm not against sealed U-joints, but I am against sealed U-joints that are right next to the catalytic converters and can cause failure. This is probably, in my mind, if you do two things as a new owner of the Land Rover, it should be 180 degree thermostat, swap out the coolant in that, and serviceable front drive shaft. And that'll take care of almost most of the headaches with these vehicles. 
Now the Rover V8 began life as a Buick 215, designed in the 60s, and Land Rover in the United Kingdom bought the rights from Buick, and they kind of modified this all aluminum, overhead valve, push rod, flat tappet V8 engine for, you know, 40, 50 years. In the Land Rover Discovery 2 trim, you're going to have a four liter V8, or in the 2004, a 4.7, and it will have Bosch fuel injection. It is the final run of this block. Now, there's some problems with it being the final run. You would think that, okay, this engine has been there for 50 years, it's gonna be just fine. I put together some history from the community, so it may be inaccurate. If anyone has any clarifications, feel free to comment below. But basically, what happened near the end of life is that Land Rover was in the process of being purchased and transferred from BMW and then eventually to Ford, and it was short on cash. They knew the this life of this motor was on its way out. And so they didn't invest in the tooling. And so the problem you had is that when they cast these blocks, the tooling was off so that the tolerances between the cylinder and the coolant passages were off and they were thinner than necessary and you had a problem with localized overheating and the cylinders liners would slip and that would essentially be the death of the motor. Now that's, that's one of the issues and it's something that is a potential buyer you really can't do anything about. If your liners are gonna slip because of a poor block casting, there's nothing you can do about it other than depending on the mileage of the vehicle, if it was going to fail, it had already failed and your motor had already been replaced. So there's nothing you can do about that. The second issue with this block happened during the late 90s when the ultra low vehicle emissions regulations were coming into play and the standards were changing. And manufacturers found that in order to meet this requirement, on existing motors, they would raise the temperature. And that was for, um, I don't know if it was warm start tests or whatever the EPA test was, they would run the engines hotter. The problem was is these motors, many of these motors in the late 90s, they weren't designed for this elevated temperature. So you had this engine block, which had, you know, sketchy tolerances between the cooling passages to begin with, and then you bump the temperature up from 180 to 190. And the theory is, is these start, stop, start, stops at these elevated temperatures eventually causes the gasket material on the head gasket to fail and you have localized heating right there above the cylinder and most people have a slip liner as a result, their engine is grenaded and they're done. Or if they're lucky, they can replace the head gasket and they're good to go until eventually the head gaskets fail again because the gasket design is designed for a lower coolant temp. Now, is that true? Is it verified? I'm not 100% sure. This is just the community, meaning the Land Rover community online, on the internet and the forums. This is kind of what they've come up with and, and I think it's fairly accurate. So the, the main reason is, is the older Rover V8 blocks, head gasket failures are not nearly as common as on the Discovery 2. And um, really the only difference, again, is that thermostat. And the thermostat design and the location is a little bit different. Now there are two ways to fix this. Um, the first is to buy the diesel thermostat, the TD5 diesel thermostat, put it in your V8. That's a 180 degree thermostat and everything seems to work just fine. You know, people worry, oh no, my heater's not gonna work. Well, the new Discovery 2 Thermostat design and location has a bypass to the heater core, so the, the heater core heats up sooner anyway, and every Rover V8 up to the Discovery 2 was a 180 degree thermostat, and nobody complained about the heater. So the heater's fine. I drive mine in the winter. The heater is fine, so that's, that's one concern. Now, another problem with the TD5 thermostat or aftermarket 180 degree thermostats is variability in manufacturing. Sometimes these thermostats don't open when they say they are, they open later. And you can test it in a pot of boiling water or just install it like I did and check it with the ultra gauge. The community reports that the aftermarket thermostats tend to be more variable in when they open and close. Now if you get one that opens sooner, that could be a good thing. 
But the TD5 thermostat seems to have better quality control. That's what I have. And it seems to work just fine. They changed the, the temperature gauge in the vehicle to essentially an idiot light. It's not a gauge. You have what looks like a gauge. In regular vehicles, the, the temperature will move. But when a lot of manufacturers, when they went to these higher end thermostats, they turned their temperature gauge into, again, what is essentially an idiot light to where when the vehicle is warming up, it's at the bottom. When the vehicle is at temperature, it's in the middle. When the vehicle is about ready to puke a head gasket, it's almost to red. When your vehicle is dead and it's ready to melt down, it's at red. So you have no range. Before you could watch your gauge and say, hey, you know, my thermostat's going bad or my radiator is clogging or my fan is failing. I'm running hot. You knew you were running hot. In this V8, you didn't know you were running hot because the gauge never moved. Now, when I noticed my thermostat was bad, I didn't have the OBD2 meter at that time. I thought my vehicle's running good. I was picking up chicken nuggets for my children because that seems to be the only thing that American kids will eat. And I'm at the drive-through and I'm watching my gauge creep up above half for the first time. And I was panicking because I had read the reports on the forums and I thought, well, I got to get this ultra gauge. So I bought the ultra gauge, installed it, and I noticed on a regular drive, I was above 210, 215, which is way too hot. And I was reading still in the middle of that temperature gauge. I don't know how hot I was in the drive through but I was above 200, 215, and it was still in the middle. So, and, and the previous owner actually replaced a head gasket. I had the records. So he had had a head gasket failure to begin with. I believe it was because the thermostat was bad, but he never changed the thermostat. They just changed the head gasket and they may have done the radiator. I'd have to look at the records. So I bought the TD5 thermostat, the 180 degree thermostat, installed it in this vehicle, and I can be in triple digit heat on fins and things in Moab, and I am at 195, 198, maybe 200 degrees. As soon as I hit the highway, I'm down to 188. And that seems to be the best preventative maintenance you can do on this motor because how your coolant passages are cast into the block, there's really nothing you can do about that. This is gonna be a little more of a potentially controversial topic, and that's oil choice. You know, it's essentially a 40 year old Buick block. It's a flat tappet design, meaning the camshaft as it rotates, the lifter is flat on the bottom and then it hits that roller and there's a lot of pressure, a point loading as the um, lifter goes up to open the valve. The best reading I find on this subject isn't from the Land Rover forums per se, but in the Bob is the oil guy forum. And for those of you that know that, those guys are insane about their oil and their specifications and everything. But the potential you have for Discovery 2 Rover V8s is that the camshaft actually wears. Camshaft wears and power's gone. And so you can replace the camshaft and some people have done that. I've never had to worry about it. And the theory of that being is you run modern synthetic oil or whatever and the modern synthetic oils are made for modern motors, which most of them are overhead cams. They're using rollers on the end of the push rods and you don't have that, you don't have that point loading. You have to go back to enthusiasts that are rebuilding muscle cars, same vintage, 60s, 70s blocks that are flat tappet. Some of them are Buick blocks, same as this Rover V8. And what the owners are doing is they're adding the ZDDP additive, which was taken out of the modern oils, and they're putting ZDDP additive in there because that puts a barrier between that roller and the flat tappet and keeps it from wearing. And they're putting the ZDDP additive in there. So you can do that on your Discovery too, but what else can you do? Well, comes to find out that extreme heavy duty diesel engine oil has similar makeup and ZDDP in it, even though the gas motor oils, the modern ones, they pulled that ZDDP additive out because it's kind of obsolete. So you have a lot of enthusiasts and there's some potential for argument here and that's okay. Put your comments below. A lot of Rover enthusiasts are running diesel motor oil in their gas V8s for that additive in order to keep their cams from wearing. Now, depending on your climate, you can get away with 15W40 um, Rotella, I believe it's T5 and it's fairly cheap diesel oil. 
And um, that seems to be the, the famous oil of choice on the forums. I used a Dello 400, which was a really good motor oil. Some people said that spec was actually better than Rotello. It was a little more expensive. I used that for a while, but the problem I have is I have cold winters too. So the 15W40 doesn't work for me. So I was changing oil twice a year. I was putting a 15W40 in during the off-road season. And then in the winter, when I'd occasionally drive it in the winter, I put a 5W40 in there, a 5W30 motor oil in there for the cold starts. Well, my 5W30 didn't have the ZDDP in, so I was potentially wearing out my camshaft. So what do you do? Well, you can do a full Rotella T6 5W40. It should hit all of your climate temperature ranges for the oil. It's a heavy duty diesel oil. It's got the, the ZDDP or equivalent additive in there. And people have had a lot of success with this oil in their discovery twos. And that's what I run. Then I only have to run one oil and it's fully synthetic and I'm good to go. Due to the kind of flaky old school design of the motor, I like to buy the heaviest duty oil filters I can. The Bosch seems to, the Bosch heavy duty seems to be a, a forum favorite. I also like the Napa Gold brand. Any of your favorite brand of oil filter is probably fine as long as you buy the heavy duty variant. And you can compare them back to forth. You can go to Walmart and actually hold the Bosch heavy duty filter and then the regular Fram filter and you'll see that the Bosch is, is just a, probably a better media. I mean, you can just tell by looking at it how much of a better filter that one is. The next potential issue in the engine bay is what Land Rover enthusiasts refer to as the Three Amigos. And the Three Amigos is your ABS light, your heel descent control light, and your traction control light lit up at the same time. It's the Amigos because they're friendly and they show up all the time to haunt you and annoy you. Well, the Three Amigos is basically a failure of the ABS system for various reasons. Now you can buy a code reader and find out exactly what those codes are and there are various fixes on the forms for this. You really don't need to be scared about this. I've had my vehicle for a, a lot of years and I have had the Three Amigos a couple of times and mine has always been a dirty ABS sensor after wheeling in the dirt. The dirt gets in there. I basically drive it a little bit, use the brakes. You don't have anti-lock braking. You gotta, you gotta be aware of that when the three Amigos are active. I use the brakes a little bit, kind of clean it out, then turn off the car, turn it back on, and my Amigos are gone. That's all I've had to deal with. Other people have had issues with the shuttle valve in this Wabco ABS unit. And the shuttle valve is, is what controls the pulsation to each wheel. Now there are various fixes on the internet, different options you can do to fix this shuttle valve without having to buy the whole piece. And it seems to be a fairly simple fix. I've never had to do it. If anyone wants to comment on how it is to fix theirs when they did the options, um, feel free to do so. But you shouldn't be scared about the three amigos. Go ahead and use that as a negotiating tactic. It is work you're gonna have to do but you shouldn't really run away from a discovery too because the three amigos are on. It's either gonna be a ABS sensor, most likely, or the shuttle valve in the Wabco controller. You know, the community theory about this three amigos failure is that it is because of, you know, residue that's built up in these passages because of lack of use. You're not activating the traction control because most of these vehicles were bought by non-off-roaders originally. Maybe even the second and third owner just liked a great SUV for the snow and the traction control never really actuated. And that causes some problems. One thing to know about Land Rover ownership is if you use it, they tend to last longer. If you sit it and try to just you know store it, that's when you have most of your maintenance issues. One thing to do preventatively, if you're not a huge off-roader, is go somewhere in some gravel and I, I don't, you know, peel out legally. However you can do it, just activate the traction control. Give it some gas, try to skid it, do it safely, please. But activate this traction control. It's easy to do on a county road. And that seems to maintain it. The owner I bought mine from actually mentioned that. He said, oh, you know, in the snow or whatever on this curb, I would kind of hit it fast. So it would activate the traction control because I hear that's good for it. And honestly, I think it was because I have never had an issue. Now I off-road it enough, so mine gets used all the time. But the previous owner really didn't off-road at all. He, he never did, but he sped out on the curb to activate that traction control. And I've never had an issue with the three Amigos. 
Sticking with the braking theme here, another issue you will see with the brakes is you may, especially if you're in colder climates, is you may see the brake light come on and your fluid will be low. And you'll see leaking down here by the master cylinder and you're like, shoot, I gotta buy a new master cylinder. Well, not necessarily. Um, what usually happens is the O-rings for the different ports on the master cylinder they're, they're not very good and they dry out over time and then when it gets cold they contract and that's when it leaks. And you can put some brake fluid in here and it will last all winter or whatever and then next summer you won't notice it and then next winter your brake light will come on, it'll be low and you'll have to top it off and you'll get this corrosive brake leak here. Now I have a do-it-yourself video that um, I've, had, I've actually had to do this repair, that's why this looks fairly new and um, you pull that off, replace the O-rings no big deal, easy job, and that should solve that one. Now let's say you're looking at a Discovery 2 that um, the owner says it doesn't start, or sometimes it starts, or sometimes it dies in the middle of the road. Chances are that is the crank positioning sensor in the back side of the block on the driver's side. What they think happens is the waterproof seal in the back fails and you get either oil or water in there and the ECU doesn't know the position of the crank, the ignition system shuts itself off to protect the motor and your vehicle dies. Typically the first sign of this happening is you'll either die on the road or you'll be stopped and most people, not all the time, most people are able to get it started again and get home. So I never really technically worried about it. I did worry about washing the engine bay. As you can see, clearly it's um, dirty and filthy. I've got some mud splatter there. I tried to hit it with the hose later and damage the insulation. And a lot of that is because of fear of hitting the crankcase position sensor. I've actually had to try to do some engine bay cleaning after a particular muddy trail down in San Rafael Swell, and I didn't really do a very good job because I was terrified of this crankshaft position sensor. Most of you that wheel in muddy environments, you have a bigger issue with this sensor than say us back west because we don't really get our engine bay wet. The water crossings aren't very deep, we're not in the mud, and it just doesn't get wet. It can be repaired, and again, I've never done this job. You'd have to go research it or look other YouTube videos. It involves going over the top, going underneath. The hardest part is figuring out how to unclip, unpinch the um, electric connector. Then you gotta get sockets with extensions up there to get the sensor in and out. And, and it's quite, you know, it was an intimidating job from what I read, not very hard, and it doesn't take very long once you figure it out. But yeah, it's always trying to figure it out in the desert on the trail. So that's something to be aware of. It's again, it's not a deal breaker. If you are in wet environments, mud, deep water crossings, that'll become more of an issue and it can be fixed. There's pictures on the internet of the type of needle nose pliers, which makes this job really easy. If you're in one of those environments, by all means, go ahead and buy them, stick them in your toolkit in one of the booths, storage bins in the back and just be ready for it in case it happens. But again, most people are able to start the engine again once it dries out and head home, and then you need to change it because if it fails for good, you're, you're stuck. So you may have read that the 2003 is the Land Rover Discovery to avoid. There, there are a number of reasons for this. First, the transfer case doesn't have a center differential lock. This was rectified in 2004, and they had a problem with bad oil pumps, which would fail and seize the motor. Now, this really is an issue nowadays if you find a low mileage diamond in the rough 2003 that everything is pretty on and you can live without the CDL or you can install a new transfer case and you just want this vehicle. You may want to just replace the oil pump um, preventatively if it's low miles. If you got high mileage, the oil pump's probably fine and I wouldn't mess with it or it's already been changed out or the motor is already seized and they put a new motor in under warranty because these failed pretty early. The oil pump on this vehicle actually has a port. You can get a oil pump gauge and pipe it into your dash or you can just measure it to make sure your, your readings are where they should be. That'll take care of that oil pump issue. You're going you're gonna to find some issues with rust on these vehicles. Usually it's in the rear, the rear quarter. Now in the United Kingdom, they have the rear quarter of the frame, 
Um, you can buy the kits and have a welder welded in. That's a common repair in, in those countries. Here in the US, I, I really don't see any problems. I used to see photos and go, oh no, there's rust on here. It's mainly surface rust. It, it, if you want to see a problem with rust, go to a Toyota forum. Those guys have rust issues like no tomorrow. Land Rovers, especially with the automatic oiling system of your oil just leaks, just constantly greasing the underside of your vehicle, there's really not too much you need to worry about as far as rust is concerned on the frame. If, if you're in a rust belt state and you want to keep this pristine, basically just grind away the surface rust, use um, some wax oil, and I got this from Rovers North, and I have never used it on my Discovery 2, but I've used almost the entire can on my Toyota Land Cruiser because like I said, as far as frame issues are concerned, the grass is not greener on the Toyota side of the court. Mine is actually really good underneath, especially for the age. Minimal surface rust on the frame just looks excellent. People have said, take a look at the frame rails next to the catalytic converters because of that heat. There can be spider web cracking there. I checked mine when I was doing the rock slider install. I haven't really had an issue. So as far as frame rust is concerned, leave that for the Toyota people. Just check out the rear quarter, hit it with wax oil if you need to, and just stay on top of it and you should be fine as far as frame rust is concerned. Now on the Discovery 2, they got rid of the regular connection, typical U-joint yoke connection at the rear end, and they put essentially a rubber bushing that sits between the rear drive shaft and the rear axle. It offers some slip as you apply torque there, and then it, it ties in, and it allows for a smoother ride. It is really nice. There's no clunking. There's no sudden shock to the system. It absorbs that shock, and you're good to go. And the problem is, is over time, it's rubber, this flex disc, and you'll get cracking. And I've got some cracking, I'll show you some images on mine, and I've actually bought a replacement. I haven't installed it, I've kept it for a couple years, but I, I just never bothered to install it because I've been observing the cracking, and it's not that bad. I bought it preemptively saying, oh no, I have cracking. But if you look online, the ones that are, haven't failed yet, they have significant cracking. The, the metal um, sleeves that the bolts go in, they're kind of wallered out, and it just, you can tell when they're gonna fail. And you wanna, you wanna keep up on that because again, a failure is gonna whip that around. So just look at that, keep up on it. Not a big deal, pretty easy to replace. One thing you should um, be aware of though is if you buy the Land Rover disc, which is more expensive, there's markings on where it should go. Pay attention to the one you have installed and put it in that way because the disc is designed to take the brunt of the torque in a specific direction, meaning forward. So if you install it backwards, and many people do, then basically when you're in reverse, this thing can handle the full 195 horsepower and all 200 and whatever foot pounds of torque. But in forward, you really can only handle a fraction of that. And the disc doesn't last very long and they fail very quickly. You can read reports of that. So just make sure when you put in this flex disc, you put it in the proper rotation. And you can see on there that one side is thicker than the other side, and that's because of the rotational force. Again, that's something to pay attention. Slide under there when you're looking to buy a car or if you've recently bought your Land Rover, slide under there and take a look at that flex disc. See how it is. If the cracking is bad and it concerns you, buy one, monitor it like I am, or just replace it. It's not a big deal until it fails. The next issue we're gonna to get to is starting to affect more and more of these as they age and the sun beats down on the top of them. And that is the headliner. Mine is starting to sag. It wasn't that bad when I bought it. I had some failure, but it's definitely not as bad as it is now. And um, that's just from age. The glue breaks down, it fails. There are plenty of write-ups and do-it-yourselves on how to fix the headliner. So it's not a deal breaker. It didn't really even look that hard to me. I haven't got around to it yet. In fact, I bought some awesome material to do a headliner with a map design. I was inspired by a gentleman on Facebook who did this repair recently. So common things to do when the headliner fails is just deal with it or rip it out and replace it. And there's plenty of do-it-yourselves on what kind of glue to use and how to do it. Um, the whole thing comes out. You can work on the bench and then just slide it in. It seems to be pretty easy. Or another popular thing to do is pull the whole thing out paint the top 
and use it without a headliner. Um, they say the only downside really to that is a little bit of road noise because you lose that layer of insulation. And when the rain hits, it's like raining on a metal roof, essentially. So there's no sound deadening there, so it can get rather loud. It doesn't appear to be extremely difficult, but something that can be done by a, a do-it-yourselfer. So um, that's something you can consider when, when bargaining a Discovery 2 or maybe even fixing your own. Now at this stage in the Land Rover Discovery's life, you're looking to off-road it. And if you're planning on off-roading it, this vehicle really doesn't come into its own until the center differential lock is coupled with the traction control. It's amazing when it has that. Unfortunately, except in 2004, it was never that way from the factory. So what do you do? Only buy 2004s, which are, are higher in the market value? No, there's something you can do. From 1999 to early sometime in 2001 model year, the center differential was actually fitted to these vehicles. It's also wired up and it works. You just have to go down and, and connect the linkage. In early 2001 and after, you may not have the center differential and then you're gonna have to buy a new transfer case, which can be quite expensive. That's something to be aware of. If, you, if you're looking at an 01, crawl underneath, fill up there to see if that linkage for the center differential is there. If it's there, you're good. If not, man, I would really, I mean, I'm an off-roader, that's what I bought this for. There's no center differential lock. I would be looking to knock money down because you can buy one and install it. You can buy a new transfer case and install it. You can do a lot of things, but you're gonna need money to do it. Buying one of these without a center differential lock, if you plan to off-road, I don't know. I, I have my biases, I think it's worthless. It's amazing with the center differential lock. It's pretty good without it. If you buy an earlier one, mine's a 1999, what are your choices in wiring this in? Well, a popular thing to do is go on eBay, find a Discovery 1 shifter from a um, salvaged Discovery 1 and install it. Okay, easy enough. Well, you're buying it on eBay. Here's some things you need to pay attention with. There's stuff you need, not just the shifter. And my shifter was seized because again, these Land Rovers aren't being used. So I actually had to work it and break it. My Discovery 1 shifter was seized and re-grease it. That was easy to do, but then you're gonna to need to make sure you have the bracket. Again, this is a cable shifter. The Discovery 1 is a linkage. And so the, trans the transfer case can be either or, because they use this transfer case in the Discovery 1. So you need to pull off your bracket adapter for the cable shift and install the bracket adapter from the Discovery 1. If you just get the shifter, you don't get the adapter, you don't have the CDL. Also, you're gonna want the seals because the linkage and everything is gonna be different. There are do-it-yourselves online on what you need for the parts if you wanna go this route. And I did that, I made sure I had all the parts. I got them all here. Well, come to find out the gator, the rubber gator, which seals underneath the boot and the shaft to keep water from coming up from a water crossing, to keep water from coming up into the cab. Mine was cracked. <clears throat> I had everything, all the parts I needed, but mine was cracked, so I had to use Permatex gasket sealer and make a gasket essentially. And I think I did a pretty good job to keep, I haven't noticed any dust coming up. Uh, definitely no water, but I don't have deep water crossings where I'm at. And I just was bummed about that. Plus you need to get certain um, linkage pieces from hardware or Amazon in order to match the linkage to get it to work right and shift good. And that takes a little bit of time and effort. It, I did save some money. If I had to do this over again, I would go to Lucky 8 or another supplier and find the Ashcroft cable CDL. And that's based on what they did in 2004 when they finally put the CDL back, they used a, a cable. I guess you could find a salvage 2004 and install that. And it's basically like that. You plug the cable in, you're good. You don't have to do any fancy cutting. You might have to cut room to move your shifter if that plate's different on the 2001s. I had to on my 1999. They have a video. Go watch the video of them installing it. So if I had to do it over again, I'd just buy the Ashcroft. It's cleaner, it's gonna seal better. You don't have to worry about parts. It'll cost you three times as much. Infinitely worth it. They don't even know I'm talking up their product. It's just, that's my feelings on the matter. Literally go under, I believe, with the 10 millimeter and crank it in yourself underneath the vehicle. But typically I find in the obstacles where you want the center diff lock, that's not when you wanna be under the vehicle, shifting it in and out. 
So I just went with that. Other people have welded and there's, there's plenty of people who have done different ideas in order to get that shifter. But I find for me personally, the Ashcroft is the way to go, install it and you're good to go. If you are later 2001, 2002, 2003, and you find a super clean discovery in those years and you love it, you don't have the center diff lock, you wanna off-road this, build it an overland beast and get your 40 billion followers on Instagram because you're gonna go everywhere with the rooftop tent, Negotiate your price point because you are going to have to modify or replace that transfer case because you want the center differential lock before you want your roof rack and your rooftop tent and all that other stuff. Think of your hardware first, get that center differential lock and that's what makes this vehicle amazing off-road. You probably already heard the jokes that if a Land Rover is not leaking oil then it's out of oil and you're about ready to die. Or another one is it is the automatic rust prevention lubrication system, because as it starts to drip, the wind hits it as you drive and it undercoats your undercarriage really nicely. But yes, leaking is a feature of the Land Rover Discovery too. And it starts up at the valve cover gaskets and they're soft material, they can be replaced. I torqued mine down once and that helped a little bit. Looks like they're loosening back up. I need to get back in those gaskets. The motor, the Buick block, uses a drain plug with a crush washer on it. Now the proper way to use that crush washer is to use it and then when you change your oil, you flip the washer around and seal it again. And you can get quite a few uses of tight seals flipping that crush washer back and forth. The problem is many of these owners, for whatever reason, they don't want to do their own oil changes, so they go to the instant oil lube place. You know, high school kid there, he doesn't really care about the different kind of drain plugs on different vehicles, so he just pulls it out and sometimes over torques it or does whatever. And when I actually changed mine the first time, the crush washer was so imprinted on one side that when I flipped it around, I had an oil leak. So I had to buy a new washer, which is what I did. I put that in, flipping the washer and everything worked well until this last oil change when I forgot to put the washer back. And so now it leaks. Yeah, every now and then just buy a new drain plug with the new crush washer, swap that out, and that'll take care of the engine. Um, the main seal, I, I don't have a main seal leak. I guess some people do. Moving back, the transfer case has a bunch of observation ports. The gaskets on those fail. Mine is weeping heavily. I'll show you a video of that. The gasket fails, it starts to leak. I put in high quality synthetic oil that was this right viscosity, but apparently that pulled the grime away and now it starts leaking like a sieve. You hear those horror stories about putting synthetic in a conventional transfer case. Well, I am living proof of that. Now I've got to reseal this transfer case. Transmission, I actually did the transmission service. I don't have a leak. Moving back to the rear axle, I have a rear axle leak. There are various ways you can fix that. You keep your fluids topped off, keep up on the maintenance, and you can combat the leaks depending on how, how hard you want it. What a potential owner and a new owner should realize about the Discovery 2 is that the factory service manuals are available. It's called the RAVE. It's the full-blown factory service manual. You'll see it quoted all the time on the forums. It's an amazing help. It's an amazing resource. It's PDF format. It's fully indexed. Download it. Follow it. It makes working on these things so easy. It's free. It's awesome. There are specifications on there. You can figure out how the systems are supposed to work. Troubleshooting tips, electrical wiring diagrams. Download the RAVE. Start looking up RAVE diagrams, seeing what you need, what tools you need, whatever. It makes the jobs a whole lot easier to work on when owning a Land Rover Discovery 2. Also, I want to give a shout out to the communities, the face group book groups, the Land Rover North America owners and Utah Land Rovers are ones I'm a part of. You know, there's um, Land Rover forums, there's the Disco Web, there's uh, various UK and Australian Land Rover forums which don't really help the American buyer because they're diesel, but some of the other problems do because the systems transfer back and forth. But the community is awesome. They help each other out, they'll um, give you tips on how to fix it, they'll give you background, and that is what makes Land Rover ownership a lot of fun. The bottom line being is if you want a Land Rover Discovery 2, don't, don't really be scared about it. Be aware of the potential issues. Be aware of the maintenance you're going to have to do. And if do-it-yourself is your thing, 
This is a great platform. There, there's definitely a place for these. They're great project vehicles. The community is awesome. The tools are available. Most of the known problems have already been solved. There are bargain prices. Jump in, give it a shot.